So this robot usually, before being shipped out of the factory, are being calibrated. So calibration of the robot kinematics essentially deals with the problem of considering this robot as measuring machine, machines that um, place their end effector somewhere in a workspace with respect to the base reference frame, and this should be made sufficiently in a sufficient accurate way. Now, uh, there are some nominal parameters that describe the kinematics, typically the length of the links, the rotation of the axis of the joints, which should be 0 degree or 90 degrees or whatever. But all these quantities, because of the construction and of the assembly of this part, may be slightly uh, different from the nominal values. And since, especially in serial open kinematic chains, if you have a small error along the chain, this is going to be amplified uh, at the end effector level. So very small error may result in a considerable error at the end effector, which is something that we don't know, we don't want to. We don't want to because uh, this system, remember, they are agile and, and dexterous, but they also should be very precise, uh, both in static condition and in dynamic condition. So this is why each robot is being tested, and here you see a machine uh, with sensor. Of course, you have an external measurement system, which is very accurate, even more accurate than the robot itself, and through which you uh, investigate the positioning in different configuration and correct with an algorithm the nominal kinematics for that particular robot arm with the name, uh, not just the model, uh, it's that specific arm, and then the robot is shipped to the end user. We won't see the details, the mathematics which is behind and the operation through which we do calibration, but this is something that uh, should be, you should be aware of. We will see it as a first topic of the second course on robotics, or advanced kinematic issues. So, how do we interface with these robots? The more conventional way that every industrial robot has is through a teach box or a pendant which is usually placed in the cabinet accompanying the robot and that can be removed and uh, brought close to the robot and on this teach pendant you have several buttons, you have a command line, uh, you have an emergency stop, there are safety procedures such that if you lose this uh, this teach box, so you cannot press to the safety buttons while moving it around, uh, the power to the motors of the robot are switched off, so that if you accidentally fall, the robot is not start moving and may hit you, okay? Uh, through this, you can uh, record a sequence of position and put them into a skeleton of a program. That later on is run uh, in execution, and this execution may go at different speed, independently of how you move the robot during the teaching phase, okay? Now, this skeleton of programs can be also saved and recalled, modified in the usual way, so changing instructions, but it is interesting that the way in which those robots can be programmed with this easy interface is intended for those people who are no experience of programming. Of course, for an engineer that is uh, used to program several devices or any software, uh, the easy way is not moving around things but just writing down some codes. But the combination of the two may be very convenient. This teach box is usually placed when the robot is in operation in this cabinet, which contains, as we mentioned already, all the power uh, electronics, which enables to drive the electrical motors, typically now, uh, that uh, actuate 
the robot motion, and that are connected to the rest of the factory floor through digital or analog input-output ports. So you have serial ports with standard like uh, RS, IEEE, uh, 422 or whatever, okay? Uh, they may have uh, also uh, an IP address so that you have Ethernet connection either on cable or wireless depending on the situation, okay? So this object which is the heart of the mechanical manipulator is not isolated in the world. You may have only one robot with a very small uh, company that desires to automate some uh, production or in general you have a, a huge number of these and these are coordinated in cells and then uh, in more higher uh, computing struct and communication structures. So talking about programming environment, I hope that this slide is clear enough to you. I will move on this side. I hope this works, okay. So this is a, a scheme taken from one manufacturer of robots. It's a German manufacturer, Rice Robotics, which highlights all things, all components, generic components in a programming environment, programming and control environment. Let's start from the top left. Here you have a 3D CAD station where you can uh, design uh, parts of the robot, assembly uh, an emulated version on the computer, and then simulate operation to check if there are collision, if everything is placed in the proper order, because the robot has some uh, table where things has to be placed, has a conveyor belt uh, providing parts and things like that. So you can simulate this. Here they are referring to a program which is proprietary, which is called ProSim. Okay, you may have whatever system. Uh, so uh, this is purely uh, on the computer size, but of course you have some interface through which you are connected with the robot controller. So you can download this program, which are only simulated, and then have it converted and transferred to a real-time executable code. Uh, on the other side, here you have uh, this computer, which uh, acts like a, a bridge in the system, is interfaced with remote computer where you can do the same thing and then especially if you have a large project you can develop part in several places and then uh, merge them uh, into this uh, environment which is called in this case virtual robot controller so it's everything it's needed for controlling the robot but it's only virtual there's no electronic part there you may acquire data and exchange data with the uh, unit that oh, supervise the cell or uh, the whole uh, factory floor through a SCADA system, which is uh, an acronym for data exchange and for supervision and control. Okay, so at some point you want to execute what you have programmed and checked. So you download this on the robot controller you have some specific controller software which is used also to connect to external sensing devices in this picture they imagine to have a laser camera here connected to a rs port uh, of course on the uh, common bus of this local controller a pc if you want or a pc like an industrial pc which has a, a standard bus in this case it's a vme bus through which you have connected memories boards and in particular a number of servo boards one or more board for the robot if you have a, a single board the single board may uh, control six twelve axes or you have multiple of this all placed on the same uh, PC bus, in this case a VME bus. Okay. 
then you have uh, an interface to other external units which may not be sensors which may not be actuator which may be something else through with which the system should communicate uh, you have a interface to the user here it can be uh, another PC with its uh, screen you have the handheld teach box and you communicate either through this controller or this, con uh, this uh, PC or this device to the system so that you can modify parameters of the controller or simply program the robot forgetting whatever it was first uh, so for getting this uh, high level interface and move the robot with your teach box save position specify velocity between position and then uh, let the execution go an infinite number of time until some switch is turned on okay this is just an example and at the end through a bus which connects the cabinet this is the cabinet actually the physical cabinet to the robot uh, you have uh, sorry you have here a bus which connects to other external ports and now what is missing in all this picture is actually the robot itself and the robot is hidden somewhere in practice is here because here I can see two lines one that gives power to the motors and one that or of course it's a it's a parallel line and one that returns the signals from the position measurement devices at the joint which are on board of the system these are so-called proprioceptive sensors in this case this is a relatively old robot which uses resolvers for measuring angular position nowadays this solution is almost uh, gone and most robots use optical encoders with high resolution 16 bits or 32 bits for representing 360 degrees okay so this is the whole programming and control architecture it's just an example there, there are variation but I like this slide because it contains more or less all what you need okay so this is another video again a commercial video but it's very impressive it's what I call the Fanta Ken challenge that shows uh, two things the fact that you can coordinate multiple robots executing a common task and the fact that you can pro you typically program motion either through the teach book or through your code at the slow speed and then you can scale up the timing so the speed while doing the same geometric path we will see later on in this course that and I can for a moment turn on the light that in general in a, a reference frame with a W which stands for word where you have placed somewhere your robot okay you define trajectories in the Cartesian space maybe connecting several points and then cycling which are in fact path geometric path which are described by a scalar parameter that goes from 0 to a certain value maybe 1 so when s is 0 you are here when s is something you are here and while proceeding you go to s max and probably you return to the same point okay so suppose that here is s 0 s greater than 0 so you have this direction and then you arrive here at s equal s max okay 
This is only a geometric description. And you can specify this via your program or by using the simple interface where you store the different point and specify how to move from one point to the other, typically in straight line or along a circle of a given curvature. Okay, but this is not the whole story because then you want to move along this path and then you add what is called a timing law. Hmm? A timing law is how this parameter describing the path changes with respect to time. And time will go from an initial time which can be taken as zero to a completion time which is capital T. And for each value of time, this function specify what is the value of S within this range. So this means that you're moving in time and you can accelerate or slow down, stop eventually, accelerate again and then stop here. Okay, this is specified by the timing law. Now, when you put together geometric paths and timing law, you have what is called a trajectory. And in this case, the robot trajectory is specified at the Cartesian level. We will see how to transform this into trajectory in the joint space so that each joint has its own reference motion and the controller will impose this motion to each of the end joint of the structure. Okay, we will come back on this. This is just for anticipating uh, the second part of the course where after dealing with kinematics we will, deal with, we will deal with the problem of how to plan such trajectories decomposing most of the time the problem into a geometric one and into a time uh, definition one so let's go back to this video and so you will see now a very complex uh, realization of motion which is obtained through programming and then scaling up the same geometric motion by changing only the timing law so here you see an, an end effector with some parts okay and here you see a coordination of three robots one is holding this tablet of Fanta cans and then uh, a second robot is moving his tip, uh, slaloming around the cans, and a third one is following the same motion by doing the same with another uh, group of cans, and there's a, uh, a bar going down. So the tolerance is very small, one millimeter. So this is the phase where you program at slow speed the motion. Okay, this is the idea. And all the motion of the tip are either straight line or circular path. Of course, with the given orientation, remember, huh? it's, the task is always not only position, but also orientation. And here you see why, I hope, clearly. Then, uh, once you have this acquired, you can speed up. Huh? by just pressing some button motion and have it at a faster pace. Okay, this is a very convenient one. Uh, if you don't make this separation between path and timing law and you just define a trajectory with respect to time and then you scale the total time, then you will typically change also the geometric path which is executed. While here, you don't want to change the path. You want to just change the timing. OK? This is very, very important. OK. I think this is sufficiently impressive, especially because you have a coordination of the three robots. And uh, uh, one advantage of having a single controller is that you have a single clock moving everything. You don't need to synchronize things which evolves autonomously. 
Okay, uh, just one slide. In the material that you find on the, on the web, you will have also a couple of videos accompanying this, but I would like to stop here. Uh, just mentioning that in industry, there are not only fixed base manipulators, but there are also many other robots which move on wheels, on, uh, uh, typically on wheels, and the wheels may be of different types, so omnidirectional or conventional wheels. And uh, here you see some examples. This is uh, uh, famous. This is the RoboGate system that has been used by Fiat in some of his uh, factories in Italy, which is carrying around uh, the whole car body, bringing it to different cells where fixed base robots were doing the assembly or the welding or whatever needed or the spraying of things. Okay. So this, I'm not covering this. Why? Because this is, as far as concerned, the mobility of the base is the subject of the course by Professor Oriolo, Autonomous and Mobile Robotics. Okay? So I will switch now to the next. Why not? Okay, uh, can I start? No? So, the next things that we will, uh, that will occupy ourselves for the remaining of the day is uh, another type of view on uses of robotics, which goes under the large definition of service robotics. So this is everything which is not inside a manufacturing or an industrial setup. Where robots are being used, how they are being used, and the list may go on forever. Okay, we will just highlight some application. And if you have something in mind, you name it, and we can discuss if there has been already some robotization of this daily life activities or not uh, around the world, okay? Can I move on? So here is a list of application domain, domain, more or less in the same order that we will analyze them, starting from top left and coming down to the final part, entertainment and humanoids. So first thing will be use of robots where the human cannot easily access. So in extreme domains, which means in the far space, underwater, uh, or even in area where, uh, like volcanoes or things like that. Another very important subject uh, or domain where robots are being more and more used is medical the medical domain. And here we distinguish essentially three types, which is uh, assistive robotics, rehabilitation, and surgical robotics. These all fall down under the te terminology of medical, but in fact, they are different things and require different type of robots and technology. And then we will move to some conventional things in the house, domotics, home cleaning, and not only home cleaning. Uh, agriculture, maybe we will skip this. Uh, lawn mowers, which is similar to vacuum cleaner, but only in an uh, outdoor environment, not so flat, I would say. Uh, food industry, exploration of uh, abandoned mines uh, in order to, for instance, restart the production of coal, uh, which was abandoned when the oil prices were very low, now that they are very high uh, in Sardinia, in Italy, or in different parts of the world, you would like to uh, 
uh, restart production of coal in mines. And then humanitarian demining. This is a very important application. Uh, around the world, there are many wars that even when they are over, they left mines distributed on civil grounds, and this causes many injuries. Uh, and other application, very funny, for instance, automatic refueling is a self-service uh, station where you are not doing the job, but the robot is doing the job for you. Uh, inspection, uh, firefighting, emergency, and then finally, a few words on entertainment and on humanoids, which is, in fact, the closest things to the idea of robots that uh, science fiction people had in the 50s or even before, and that could be used in any of this context. And in fact, some humanoids are being used in space. Uh, humanoids are using in uh, civil construction or are going to be used soon uh, for emergency. Wherever you need the mobility of a human being, so not a robot that moves on wheels, but on legs, but has the manipulation, manipulation capability of uh, our arms. So you need all the four limbs in order to uh, perform satisfactory in very complex environment. OK. Uh, the other things that we, the only classification, which is also the classification used in statistics by, for instance, World Robotic Report, which accounts for professional service robot and for personal use service robot. Personal use are home cleaning, professional are medical robots, uh, just to make a distinction. Home cleaning, there are many low-cost robots. Medical surgery is performed by relatively few robots around the world, each of which may cost up to 1.5 million euros. Okay, so this is uh, the idea. Okay, let's start this journey with space robotics. On the left, you see one first robot that went exploring planets. So this is the NASA Sojourner, the first robot that landed on Mars. There has been uh, other missions. Uh, in the first place, you had a, a very, uh, uh, I mean, a wheeled robot with fixed wheel, so this wheel could not reorient. So they proceed by skid steering, but the suspension of this wheel were very advanced so that it could adapt to very uneven terrain, different type of uh, rigidity or soil uh, types, uh, from sandy to rocky. Uh, on top, you see this plate is full of solar cells, because this robot has to, needs energy for mobility and has batteries, but this battery has to be recharged. And Mars is quite farther away uh, from the sun than uh, our planet, Earth. So this is a very critical aspect, huh, to keep this clean and to point them uh, in the right direction. Uh, the following expedition had more or less the same kinematics of the wheels, but mounted on board a manipulator. A manipulator with a gripper, and with this manipulator, the robot could go around and collect stones and ha had an internal lab where analysis of the materials in these uh, rocky stones could be made and the information sent. Uh, on the Earth, for instance, looking for water or water traces on the planet Mars. Now, this is an activity which is done by these few robots there. Another milestone in the application of robots in space was this first experiment made by the German Aerospace Agency, Deutsche Luft- und Raumfahrt, DLR stands for that. The project was called Rotex, and this is the Rotex arm, which is a seven degree of freedom 
manipulator with revolute joints. Very lightweight in construction. I don't, I don't know if you see it. I mean, this is uh, a low construct picture. But in fact, the links are whole. They are not solid links. They are whole, just the surface for going to one place to the other, from one joint to the other. And this is because in space, uh, the mass is not relevant. I mean, so this is almost massless. The robot stays there where you leave it. Doesn't have to sustain gravity. I mean, there is some few residual gravity components, but uh, this can be neglected. Is overcome by friction essentially. Uh, so this is a, a robot that, if placed on the ground, was not able to sustain itself. Was bending and not capable of moving because the motors were too heavy for the structures. Okay, so this requires the thought of how to design lightweight robots that can work on Earth and do not bend and are accurate enough. And in fact, this project was the ancestor of all the lightweight robots developed later on by DLR and then moved to the factory to the industrial production by KUKA, by ABB, and other American manufacturers. OK, uh, so this was the experiment that had to be done was a telemanipulation experiment. So the uh, mission experts, so astronauts, were commanding the motion of this robot, looking at some uh, image recorded by a camera mounted at the tip. Uh, the end effector of this robot was highly mechatronic design. So in the end effector, you had the gripper, you had the proximity sensor, you had the camera. And this information from the camera in particular was sent uh, on the ground station on Earth and then back on the space shuttle. So on the video, the uh, astronaut could see what happened and operates by sending command that went back to the ground station and again to the robot on the space shuttle. Why this strange arrangement? Because uh, telemanipulation had to be tested in extreme condition. If you're planning to do the same with somebody on Earth and the manipulator on Mars, then these large delays becomes essential for understanding what happens. And here I have uh, two short videos of these two situations. So robots exploring surfaces of planets and the uh, Rotex in operation. So on the left side, you see that uh, motion control, in, in this case, I hope this starts. Yes, yes. Uh, and planning. The elementary motion is very hard. Why? Here you see one left wheel of the six wheel of this vehicle that is progressing on a very sandy uh, soil where more than half of the wheel goes uh, under. So it has to decide if continuing to apply rotation in the same direction or stop, return, rotate, and so on and so on. Okay, it's a very critical task. Uh, which should be performed in an automatic way, locally on the vehicle. So, analyzing the effort of the motors uh, actuating the single wheels. Okay. More or less, this is the idea that I want to convey. And here, the second video is, as the title says, it's a very short video, so pay attention. I, I will tell you first what you will see. Essentially, you will see a view from the camera within the gripper, OK? So one of the tasks was catching floating objects. Uh, we are in space, no gravity, so object left alone, they float in space. And the astronaut should use the robot gripper to go and pick them, OK? So this is what happens. Okay, this is a, an hexagon or a, maybe an icosahedron, which is, I mean, not moving in fact, but it's the robot that is approaching and then 
closing the grip. So you see this object and you're getting closer until commanded by the astronaut. So this is telemanipulation, it's not autonomous motion of the robot itself. There are a lot of story, but it's not time to tell them now. Okay, uh, you, have, you may have seen this. Uh, on the space shuttle, outside now, in extravehicular activities, EVA, how they are called in, in astronautics, uh, there was this huge manipulator, which has a name, SSRMS, which stands for Space Shuttle Remote Manipulator System. The nickname was Canadarm because it was developed mostly by the Canada Space Agency as the name, as the brand name on top. Uh, and it's a six degree of freedom robot with huge arm and forearm. Uh, this and this. And then at the end there is some uh, additional joints and, and the factor, plus a rotation of the base. So this uh, huge arm was folded inside the space shuttle when the space shuttle was leaving ground and then when in orbit uh, the lab opened and this arm deployed itself to do some operation typically recovering satellites uh, in bad condition to repair them or remove them from space. You know that there is a lot of space trash there. Eh? This is one problem in space. It's uh, unbelievable, but it's like this. Uh, and this was one of the, or, or putting in orbit some satellite. So the satellite was stored inside the space shuttle and was put in orbit, not by the astronauts. Remember that one hour of extravehicular activity costs much more than moving around this arm, manipulated, telemanipulated by the astronauts themselves. Because of its length, so this, of course, is weight considerably, but the weight, again, is not a problem. Still, if you have such a long arm and you're moving it fast, this arm tends to vibrate. Okay, so the inertia is important. This is why the, uh, the astronauts were moving quite slowly this arm. And there is no big need of timing, although, again, prolonging the mission is uh, expensive. And there are techniques, actually, control techniques, which are developed on ground in order to control the vibration of such large structure where uh, some deformation is unavoidable. Still, we would like to keep uh, damped vibration and accuracy at least at the end of factor level. So there's a basic control problem that has a very nice application in space robotics. Uh, this picture on the right instead is a, a different story. You know that the space shuttle is over, uh, the mission are no longer there, but we have an international space station going around the Earth 40 times, I guess, a day. There are also Italian astronauts from time to time. It's an international mission. And outside the ISS, there is this kind of large rails that covers all the structure. And on that rails, the idea, this is just a sketch. Now the, the arm is really there. So this is a Canada Arm 2, if you wish, which has uh, not fixed base, but slides on this rail, and if you want to describe it kinematically, this is like having a first prismatic joint, huh? because you move linearly. You move the all the structure which is beyond this joint is moved linearly by the motion of, along the rail, and then a, a number of revolute joints till the end effector, which is a very sophisticated end effector with multiple capability rotating I mean, grippers of different types, in order to do uh, maintenance externally to the space station. To the uh, space station. Okay. Uh, the idea is that on top of this 
arm, sooner or later there will be a humanoid carried around which then detaches and then operates with only, I mean, it's a upper torso humanoid without legs because it doesn't need to walk in space, okay? But it needs to manipulate things. Why this humanoid of the same size of a human? Because it has to use the same tools that an astronaut would use. So there are nothing things uh, designed on purpose, but depending on situation, you may use the humanoid or the astronauts for doing external activities. Okay, so this is one principle very important. So just to have an idea, we will skip this video. Hello? This is skipped, but I, I will show you now this uh, short video which shows the space shuttle arm in motion. Let's. So I don't know if you see this. This is very hard. So here, uh, it's moving. You see the top where the, light, where the sunlight is coming. So this is moving, and this gives you an idea of the, how fast the robot is moving. This is the whole dimension of the space, space shuttle. So we are, the size is about 15 meters or 20 meters or so. OK. So just to have a feeling of how these robots move in space. OK, let's move to the next critical environment, now on Earth, actually underwater. There has been many, many devices developed. Of course, all sealed with technology. Like when you're shipping a robot in space, you have to qualify the technology that you're using for space operation, which extreme variation of temperature huh? between uh, minus 100 degrees and plus 150, 200 degrees, with uh, some electromagnetic influence to be carried over. When you're putting a robot in water, of course, you cannot have electrical motor operating without being sealed or things like that. So there's a technological aspect which is very important. This is an underwater robot developed by the Italian National Research Center which was used uh, uh, in some operation in uh, South Pole. Uh, here you see a typical underwater robot, which looks like a ship or uh, a whale, uh, which moves underwater. And there are also strange things like this uh, Odin robot. And the, the nice things about this last robot is that this is an omnidirectional robot. What does it mean in water? It means that it's actuated by jets uh, here, so that this single body, uh, this, this ball is a single body which can go around in any direction and change orientation along any axis. In fact, it has six pair of thrusters, this is the name, uh, that allows to reorient and move around this. This is very unusual. This is why I put this picture. Typically, all these underactuated robots uh, that float in water are, uh, have a, a mechanical definition which is underactuation. Underactuation means that when seen as six as uh, rigid bodies with their six degrees of freedom, you have less than six command to have their motion. And this is not uncommon. And maybe I can draw something on the, on the blackboard. So imagine that you have uh, I will sketch the Odyssey on top, so there is some flat like this. So b besides some uh, stabilizing part, there are four thrusters put at the end. 
which means that this can move by actuating with different uh, speed, this thruster. It can go straight or it can go along a curve, it go up, down, and so on. So it can go in several directions, but not in all directions, instantaneously. For instance, it cannot move sideways. Okay. It may or may not go backwards, but this is less important. Okay, if you uh, and sideways means not in this direction, not in this direction. So at least two directions are forbidden. So if I want to go from here to here, so exactly move down, I have to maneuver. I have to make something like this and go there. Okay. Does this remind you of some other vehicles having the same problem? Virgilio? Ah, oh, okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> dirigibile. <laughs> uh, so it's the Zeppelin. <laughs> okay. Yes, of course. But also airplane. Uh, an airplane. Uh, except for so-called VTOL devices, vertical takeoff and landing, uh, they cannot move like this. Okay? And they ca cannot also move like this. While VTOL aircraft can, but these are only of military use. Okay? Uh, now, you, you can buy these types of things so-called quadcopter, so kind of helicopter with four rotors uh, that can move around and are used as drones or similar things or just to overlooking the traffic when uh, a soccer game is taking place or whatever. And it's the same problem because you cannot go in any direction. Still you have full mobility, you can go everywhere, but you have to maneuver. Same for a car while parking. So all these problems uh, are related to the fact that you cannot have uh, as many independent command as the uh, number of degrees of freedom intrinsic to the single body. These are all single body devices. Okay? So this is very interesting. And this is one of the main problems for underwater robotics beside the very critical environment where your sensing system are put under uh, difficult operational uh, conditions. Pressure is high when you go down. Uh, also visibility, if you plan to use cameras, uh, may be corrupted, there is no light, and all these things are very important for autonomy. Here I have a couple of videos. Let's start with this one, which shows exactly this kind of mobility. This is an underwater robot developed in Canada, uh, UBC Gavia. And it's uh, like a torpedo. Huh? Here you see the, uh, one of the thrusters. There is a short possibility of changing direction by correcting the flaps like in a vehicle. You see that this is a, a view from a camera underwater and this is uh, what you can see. So, Of course you have to have everything on board on those systems. Fine, I think that you get the point. Now this is a more conventional Use. So this is a, a robot de developed by Ansaldo in Genova, uh, doing some task underwater. In this case, a very simple task. So hooking uh, a cable on some floating object underwater. So this is a standard industrial gripper. So it has only two positions, opens or closes. Okay. Uh, 
The whole structure is sealed uh, to sustain the presence of water, to avoid that water enter into the structure. And now the, the gripper will approach uh, a, par, uh, a position where it can take okay, this object, which is a hook, actually, connected with a, a rope. So carrying around this. And now, uh, if you see below the end effect, this device here is a sonar, which can detect object at some distance and give a map of the environment close to the end effector. So while moving around the hook, of course, this rope is being uh, uh, unwinded and you can measure how far you, you are. Now this is the object that should be hooked and you go there and of course the hooking requires some sequence of elementary motion, so pressing and then going back and eventually this can be released and, uh, and now you see very well the, the sonar placed around. So this is a conventional articulator manipulator with all revolute joints. It can be described exactly like we described those on Earth, but here it requires some technological condition in order to uh, operate underwater. Uh, this is uh, another strange amphibious robotic vehicle, vehicle that can uh, let me that can walk on the beach but also float in water uh, it's a very nice idea so with these six flaps which are flexible uh, to have an idea of uh, what is on board so this this is the size is about 18 kilogram so it, the locomotion is through these flippers that can rotate in one or the other direction and adapt to uh, the surface or float in deep free water. There's a maximum depth due to the pressure. And it's nice to see what are the cameras on board. There are two cameras, one front and one back. Then there is a, an acoustic sensor for a, localization and for exploring also the uh, the bottom of the sea and then there's a, another sensor which is made by three camera placed in such a way that you have also a depth information okay of course the cameras cannot see very well as soon as the water is not clean so if you're doing this experiment maybe uh, very close to the North Pole in Canada or at Hawaii, then things are okay. But if you're doing this in the harbor of, uh, I don't know, Rotterdam, uh, then this is a more critical point. And last but not least, remember those autonomous systems have to carry everything on board. So the power source and the autonomy of the, of the batteries is a very critical aspect. Okay, exploration. Now let's move back on uh, ground. This is a typical device, uh, now pretty old, uh, developed at CNRS in Toulouse, in south of France. We have a strong cooperation with this research group. And the design actually was a, a Russian design made by a researcher before the uh, um, fall of the wall, huh? so it's, it's uh, USSR, not, not Russia. Uh, and it's very tricky because you see that these wheels, again, are with suspension and have a form that is able to mount on rocks and, and perform maneuver even in very uh, uneven terrains. And this is a, a test plant with rocks and things in Toulouse. Uh, on top, you see a stereo camera, uh, and then the, all the electronics is, again, carried on board. This is the same story, but this is a, a, an output of an Italian project, which was called Robovolk by the University of Catania, 
for exploring and monitoring the activities of the Etna volcano. And you can have a different type of mobility. Here are two short videos, one showing a wheeled robot. On the left, you will see it in a few moments. And here you have a, a tracked wheeled robot. Depending on the type of surface, you may prefer one or the other. Here is the mobile version. Again, suspension are very important. Stability is also important. And the purpose of this object is just to stay there, move around, uh, collect data to be transferred to a, a station which is remotely in a safe area, and so on, without having a human operator being there. This is also an extreme condition in general. It may be very nice to, s to see, but not always. OK, mobility. So demining. Here you see two. Uh, simple devices, which are again can be considered robots because they have sensor, they have mobility, uh, and they connect uh, perception with actions. This is uh, used by uh, police department for bomb disposal. This is a very nice thing that I found on the internet. It's very light. There are two bicycle wheels, uh, slightly inclined, with a detector uh, which is moving slightly over the ground. Uh, it has been developed by the Col Polytechnique of Lausanne. And uh, it's not too uh, heavy like the other one. So in case it's not able to recognize a mine, it will explode. But the loss is not so tragic. The trend in demining is really between two lines of thought. On one side, very complex devices, very heavy, that can uh, recognize many things. But if something goes wrong, uh, they are very expensive. On the other hand, you can use uh, multiple small devices, uh, which do the same. They may not perform as good, but uh, their loss is not so dramatic. OK, so this is an important thing. If you're interested in humanitarian demining, I can give you reference to a working group that uh, promotes these activities. OK, let's move to uh, the, uh, this other very important area of medical robotics. So first thing, this is aiding patients. Uh, this is one story. For instance, here you have a, a, an old person that can walk but needs some uh, help, uh, like sustaining device. There are, in Germany, they call them rollator. Uh, there may be also here in Italy. It's very difficult to use this on the streets, especially in Rome, uh, even on the uh, boardwalk. Uh, but the idea is that by, I mean, there's a physical uh, sustenance, also a pressure that the user uh, implicitly makes on the wheel device. In front of the device, there's a, in this prototype, there's a sick laser which detects obstacles and corrects slightly the natural motion movement commanded by the user who is walking around. Uh, it's walking with this. But maybe not so firmly to uh, avoid obstacles. So there is a, a cooperation. The command is modified, so the device uh, slightly deviates from the natural motion of the human so that obstacles are avoided. So it's a integrated help. Uh, and this is one idea. This is much more complex. This is a um, European project uh, headed by the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna in Pisa, some years ago now, called MoveAid. And the idea is to develop uh, an intelligent housing, in particular a kitchen, and a robot in this kitchen that could perform operation for uh, disabled people. Okay. 
So here you see this is a Dexter arm. It's a very lightweight design. Uh, you will see it now in motion. Uh, bringing some water uh, to a person and then being able to open the fridge or uh, turn on the light upon vocal commands or other type of uh, interface. For instance, this is a very, very old video. Uh, I hope you see. So the robot is here on the side. You see, it's a conventional serial manipulator arm. This had eight degrees of freedom. We have had uh, one copy of this robot in our department up to a few years ago. Now it's in retired, I would say. Uh, so the nice thing is that the, the structure is very light because there is no motor placed anywhere there. All the motors are here or at the base. Okay? So there's a, this part which is relatively heavy, but the moving part which gets close to the human is really a few kilograms. Okay? And the transmission is made by cables and pulleys. So there are uh, um, steel cables going around the whole structure so that the motor can move remote joints in an efficient way. And here you see there is a gripper at the end. This is uh, the robot being commanded to open a microwave oven uh, very slowly. Too slowly, maybe. <laughs> uh, maybe it's, it's, oh, no, okay, he is come. He is coming, okay? So p pay attention. This is a, a, a trivial task. Uh, but even in this trivial task, if you notice correctly, I'm holding the handle. Now, when I'm holding a handle and opening a, a door, I could do the same. I'm not just changing position, but I have to change also orientation in a coordinated way. Otherwise, I will, if I have a firm grasp, I will exert too large forces either on the gripper or on the handle of the microwave oven. So this simple task requires already coordination of linear motion and angular motion at the level of the gripper. Okay? Again, very important. This second is... Uh, honestly said, even more silly now, this dates at least 10 years ago, and this is uh, just cleaning, huh? oh, it's a very short, let, let, let's see it again. So this is cleaning in contact. Huh? The idea of robot not moving around uh, in free space, but interacting with some solid surface, luckily enough, there is this uh, very soft uh, object through which you clean or rub the surface, okay? This is something that now can be done very efficiently. At that time, it was uh, a novel idea. Okay, let's conclude this medical part and then we can have a break. So rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is a, a very, you can imagine, very important thing and it goes through several steps. You may have amputees, you may have people with, with central nervous system problem that has to learn again to walk. And robot can be used uh, as a device to support or replace missing parts of the human locomotion or manipulation. Uh, in order to do this, for instance, for amputees, you have devices that can replace the forearm or the, just the hand uh, of an amputee. And the idea nowadays is to use, if these are available, available or still functional, the same electrical signal that the original muscle used to receive from the central nervous system to drive the uh, mechanical part which replace a hand or so. Here you see a, a picture taken from a, an experiment on monkeys where the monkeys had still their arms but uh, fixed behind the back. 
so the electrical signals were fully functional and were used to drive a robotic arm for doing something. So, for instance, for bringing food uh, to the mouth. Okay, so after a training period, the monkey was able to use this in place of his arm and uh, validated the concept of connecting a physical electrical, electro electrical signal to a, a mechanical device, a simple robot in this case. Okay, there are even more critical uh, interfaces. For instance, if your commands from the nervous system are gone because of different diseases so that the only signal that you can take out of intention of the human is taken directly from the brain. This category is called brain computer interface. You have different sensor, non-invasive one, so you can wear a kind of a helmet with electrodes that sense the activity of the various parts of the cortex and associated to some area, there is some motion commands. Motion commands that are still there, even if you have no longer your arms, okay? So you can imagine a motion. You activate some parts of your brain. This is detected, and this is converted into some motion of a device uh, uh, or whatever. You can decide to turn on the light in your room by thinking about doing this activity or some equivalent activity after some training phase. So you think of something and an action results. This is a very important thing. Uh, talking about rehabilitation, uh, I removed here the picture of uh, Oscar Pistorius, after the recent event, but he was using uh, a, a prosthesis by a company in Iceland, Osur, that of course had a lot of advertising from uh, the races of uh, Pistorius, but in fact it develops prostheses which are of use for amputees of the lower limbs. And the nice thing is that this is not only a leg, uh, with some uh, high-tech materials, but at the level of the knees where this is uh, uh, implanted or uh, uh, connected to the remaining part of the human body, there is some variable stiffness implemented. Because when you walk, and I'm sorry that I have to walk now, when you walk and you're doing something without even thinking, you're actually contracting and relaxing your muscles, but also the looseness of your uh, knees, depending on uh, the phase of your locomotion. This is very important to get some natural feeling of motion. And this is so important that it is used in prosthetics, but it's also used in new generation of humanoid that used to walk in a very stiff way, very unnatural with respect to how we do walk. And the idea of using joints and actuation which change their stiffness, their rigidity, while moving uh, on the fly, app appears to be a very successful one. Okay, so this is a, a very important thing. Motion, controlling motion, but also controlling stiffness of the joints. We call this variable stiffness actuation joints. Uh, so rehabilitation means not only replacing parts, but also helping a human to recover after a stroke, for instance. Doing some motion that uh, needs to be learned again, like if we were uh, children and have to do this again. So there are uh, articulated chains of bodies like a robot arm but in fact they are wearable uh, so that you can insert your legs or arms and then that are in practice like robots but they share their mobility with the human. So if I'm wearing one of these uh, 
uh, device like this Rupert developed by the Arizona State University in the US, uh, I can move this device completely actively with my muscles. And the only thing that I would like to have is that this does not weigh too much on my arm. Okay, so it, there's a problem of functionality. But if I cannot move my arm, then the motors that actuate the joints of this uh, prosthesis can move the arm for me, can move my arm uh, together, which is connected to this structure. And while doing this motion, I reactivate partially my muscle and learn to do this movement in the right way. And progressively during the therapy, I go from a completely assisted situation to a completely autonomous situation. This time I'm done. Okay. So the combination of uh, cyclic motion executed partly by the machine and partly by the human being is a very challenging task. So these devices are usually called exoskeleton huh? because they are skeleton mounted outside like some animals have it. Uh, they are used also for telemanipulation, for master-slave operation. Uh, this is a situation where you, the operator wears one of these devices and there's a remote, similar in kinematics, slave robot reproducing the same motion. Or reproducing the same motion scaled by a factor. Okay? And this is uh, one example you see from the dates. It's quite old, but... I think it's very representative of what you can do. So the uh, exoskeleton is the master, and the robot is a conventional one. That, so this motion is commanded by a human. Huh? And even assembly task can be done. Of course, this is next to next, but it can be remotely as far as you wish provided that you provide, you give back some uh, force feedback, especially for assembly tasks. Uh, last medical robotics part, well, it's not the last one, but it's the last slide for before the break. Uh, it's changes now, rehabilitation, assistive robotics is one side, and then there are used in the hospital. Uh, there are a lot of possibility of using robots in hospital, replacing low-level activity, collecting a blood sample from the beds of the uh, rooms and bringing it to a central lab. Uh, not done by a human that walks around the hospital, but made by a robot. Or bringing uh, food uh, in uh, tablets at the right time. So to make the long story short, this is one such robot, it's called Helpmate, and it's famous not, on, not just because, of, I mean, not because it's really innovative, but because it was uh, produced by the same man, so Joe Engelberg, that made the first industrial robot so it was kind of a paradigm shift from industry to service. I said, OK, I'm saturated by that. I want to do some other application of robotics which go beyond the factory floor. And this is some, OK? So this is one of these devices uh, in, a, in a floor in a hospital, just standing there. Mm? But it's a robot, so you see a, a little girl which is attracted, but fascinated, but also a little. And now the, the nurse is instructing the robot. There is a simple interface. Here you can have very fancy interfaces, like in this design by the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany. And then the robot starts moving. The girl runs away. But of course, it has to localize itself it has sensors to have a collision avoidance with dynamic obstacles, so per person walking normally in the hospital, uh, but also tracing some landmark 
either artificial or natural, uh, like the lights on the, on the ceilings, to locate exactly himself in large spaces. Uh, this is moving. There are systems like this at the Gasolini Hospital in Genova. There are systems like this being introduced also in the uh, Gemelli Hospital here in Rome. So this is a very promising area of use of such robots. Okay, let's have a break now for 15 minutes. <laughs>